So, is there anybody here who is not part of the communication program? I don't see anybody. So you were all actually in the debate just a little while ago. <coughs> okay, except you, because you were the year before. <laughs> and you, maybe. I didn't take the first course. Right. Are you, are you in the communication program? Yes. Or? Right, so this is... Uh, most of you have been taking the course on rhetoric then, not you perhaps, and not you. Oh, last year. Yeah. So actually one person. That means that uh, a number of uh, concepts don't need to be explained to you that much, or maybe you need a little repetition. We'll see. Uh, the purpose of this course is to uh, make the study of, of rhetoric a little more cross-cultural. So, uh, whenever I start a course, I always like to ask this question, why is this course going to be interesting? And we'll start by, since this is supposed to be a seminar, by asking you that question. So you get a few minutes to talk to your neighbors, and uh, then we'll hear what you think. Why is why is it interesting to study cross-cultural rhetoric? Right? So, uh, I think uh, we can uh, learn about other, other cultures and, uh, the, uh, and to compare with my culture. And yeah, but you do that in intercultural communication in general, don't you? Yeah, it, it might be in a different way and but it's more difficult. Okay. Any other ideas? Yeah? Yes? And culture represents our inner values, the values we grew up, and, and shapes us in many, many different ways, and also influences the way how we talk and how we are. Right. And if we are going to be confronted or have to negotiate with people from another country, from another culture, and the person is trying to convince us or really convince us, I think it's more and smart to be able to analyze and have a good understanding about the cultural and communicative values he might represent in order to not be tricked in a bad contract or to come up with a great solution in a team when you're able to communicate to team members. Yeah, sounds like valid and good reasons to study cross-cultural rhetoric. Anything else? Yeah, we will mention as well that uh, sometimes uh, some cultures, our background, can uh, affect what and how we are speaking. Yeah. And why some speaker is giving this way his speech. So we can analyze and understand better why some cultures they use more factors and some other cultures they use more logos because they were created like that. Like for example, in Polish speeches, if you analyze, there is much factors. Because in Poland, it's like Poland as a hero of Europe, you know, and like Christ of, uh, Jesus Christ of Europe, we're always suffering. And this is important for us. We always will answer this in our speeches. Because of background. Yeah. And it's good to know about it so that you yes. can understand the Polish person when he's speaking with his yes. emotions. Why is he speaking so much with emotions? It is very difficult to understand for us. Right. Any, uh, any other thoughts? Okay. But anyway, you're a little motivated. You chose this course, so probably you have some idea. Or you think it might be interesting. Some idea over and above the idea that you're not going to get an exam, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, here's what I want to say. It's not so different from what you were saying. Uh, that's the idea is that there are many reasons for why people meet today. And that's going to be so during your lifetime. Meet people from different cultures meet. So there's going to be a lot of cultural communication. Many of those situations will also involve <coughs> rhetorical skills. 
you have to persuade people of different things. You have to argue with them. You have to show that you are right or they are right, that you are wrong or they are wrong, etc., etc. And what goes down well in one place might not go down so well in another place. In this course, we also stress the historical aspect a lot. So we'll see the origins of some of the uh, main ways of arguing in the world. There, actually, there are very long historical traditions for what we consider to be a good argument. So maybe the Egyptian tradition, either, is the Egyptian girl here? No. Is not so similar to uh, what I take the Chinese tradition. We have a lot of Chinese people, some Chinese people. And we will be looking at some of these, uh, of these traditions. And we will be considering mostly what's in red here, cross-cultural cross comparison. And there will not be so much study of what one might call intercultural communication, which is when two people from different cultures actually confront each other. There will be more like this is what the Chinese do and this is what the Indians do. And we, we don't have, we'll have a little data on what happens when Chinese meet Indians. But it will be more on the uh, comparative side. And of course, being aware of uh, the cultural backgrounds of what people do is one of the uh, ways in which you can maybe sometimes understand why there are misunderstandings between people, because you can see that they are now thinking this way, which is very common in their country, and they are thinking in another way, which is very common in their country, and that's why they are perhaps thinking in slightly different ways. Um, yeah, and, but of course there will also be an underlying, another underlying idea here, is that, and that is one should not, and I'll come back to that. Let's see how much time we have to, but. I'll come back to that, and I think you've heard this before in courses on intercultural communication, I hope, that human beings are not totally different. They are also to some extent similar. It might be that some types of argumentation are valid in all cultures. And we'll debate that. We'll look at that. <coughs> okay, so what is rhetoric? So everybody here except one person has had classes on rhetoric already. Uh, you can give many, many definitions of rhetoric, but uh, the classical definition usually includes something about persuasion. So the classical definition is something like the art of persuasion. That's how to persuade other people of some proposal that you have. Okay. Um, and especially, I wrote in brackets, especially in public speeches. So it might be one thing to convince your husband or loved one, you know, you have various tricks to persuade them. They might not be as successful when you're in a public speech. So if you promise to make, I don't know, their favorite pastry, <laughs> a pastry expert over there. <laughs> That might work <laughs> sometimes, but it might not work. Well, who knows? I never tried it. <laughs> okay, so, so different situations require different means, and that's true in all cultures too, and we'll come back to that. What's the classical rhetorical term for situational adaptation of your arguments? Let's see how much you remember of the course. Starts with a K, and it sounds very much like the capital of Egypt. Cairo. Very good. Cairo. <laughs> S on the end. <laughs> right. Kairos. And that's the art of adapting your, your argument to the circumstances so that you might be more successful. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you think this is a good definition? Is there some, sometimes I talk to people and they don't really like this definition for some reason. Is there somebody here who would propose a different definition of rhetoric? As you saw in the debate we just had, it, sometimes definitions of terms are uh, important for what you end up thinking. 
So, you don't like that definition? No. If you're, if you're fine with you. <laughs> so, nobody seems to have any great problems with this definition. Maybe, I'm sorry, maybe we don't need to persuade necessarily. This is, maybe it's like more about to, to, to speak well, nice. No, the classical definition is this, but you would no, like... No, 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 but I'm just thinking like if uh, this is really about our speech, if it's really only about the pressure rate. Yeah, that's what rhetoric is about, yes. Yeah. You, might say, you might think that there is a way of speaking well which is not persuasive, perhaps, but it's not what classical rhetoric has, has uh, set out to study. Mm. It might be. I mean, you could have, for example, you have a... A poet coming up and uh, giving a nice poetic speech and it's not supposed to persuade anyone of anything maybe about the beauty of his speech but that's it it's possible you could study that but that's not the focus of, of you know that's okay so and if you wanted to change the definition of rhetoric to that I think a lot of people would perhaps think it's too wide but yeah, but that's the kind of debate one could perhaps imagine having on you know, how much should the cover, how much should the term cover. And so other people say that uh, you should not say anything about public speeches. But actually, the truth is that 90% of what rhetoric is, has been about is public speaking. So uh, and some people say that rhetoric is just as relevant in the uh, bedroom as in <laughs> on the big square. Well, I don't know. <coughs> okay, so if you want to do an analysis of rhetoric, you can use uh, activity-based communication analysis, and you can come up with this definition or this way of describing it. So the activity is typically public speech. The purpose is persuasion, to trigger emotions, to get agreement with those who are speaking with. Two, the roles, typically a speaker and an audience. The artifacts, typically your voice. There could be nowadays loudspeakers, screen projection. But of course, in the classical rhetorical situations, you have to trust your own voice. So you have to, if you had problems with speaking, you had to go to special practice. You all know this classical, one of the great orators of classical Greece, have you heard of him? The guy who walked along the seashore, picked up small stones, put them in his mouth, and then tried to speak louder than the sea. After having done this for some time, he became a master orator. <laughs> he was able to command the attention of everybody on, on the Agora in Athens. So if you, if you have a weak presence, you have to do something to you know, get carry over. And if you look at stand-up comedians, you, you sometimes watch stand-up comedians. Yeah. One of the concepts they have is energy, right? You have to, you have to keep energy. I mean, stand up for one hour and make jokes that people <coughs> think is funny. It's not. It's pretty tiring. So you have to have tiring. You have to have some energy to do it. Yeah? Yeah, but in this way, I, I, I cannot be agreeing 100% because, uh, for example, uh, if a talk on Swedish people, when you talk with them uh, very loud, they uh, not listen to you, you know, uh, they cannot uh, take as much text what you're saying, actually. Mm -hmm. But a because public they... speech is not sitting down at the table drinking coffee with someone. Okay, uh, what about uh, when you're talking too loud, you know, Depends sometimes? Depends on where. Yeah, I mean speech, you know, but so where? somebody, like, you know, the tour. On the square. Oh, yeah. Doesn't matter. No, but it does matter a lot. Because because this way of speaking so that everyone hears it and so on, that's appropriate on the square. But it's not so appropriate if you just sit down over a table and drink coffee or something. That's Kairos again. That's the whole thing. You have to ad adapt your speech to the circumstances. Okay, when it's auditorium, it's a lot of people, uh, everybody's out and you would like to get uh, their attention, you know, and you start uh, to, to shout, but people anyway don't listen to you, but when you uh, talk uh, not so loud, uh, monotone, you know, sometimes people take more attention to you, you know, than you speak loud. On a big square? 
on the auditorium. If you have a loudspeaker, maybe, so that they can actually hear you. But if you speak on, in a monotone voice and you speak low, the ones who are at the back of the room are not going to hear you. So but, but with modern technology, it might be possible to try that, where you have a microphone and loudspeakers and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes, I have a very, very practical question. Yeah? Uh, if, your mind, if you feel that your mind is going faster than your mouth, that's a problem. Yes. <laughs> so you want to you want to ease your mind so that it can catch up with your mouth can catch up with your mind or you know they are yeah. in sync. Yeah. What 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 do you do? <laughs> <laughs> because you I, know I, exactly what you are going to say and how you are going to say it, but when once you start to speak, your mind is just too fast. Your you mouth ever, doesn't catch up. Did you ever try taking the deep breath? Yes. That could work. <laughs> you seem to be aware of this problem yourself, right? So yeah. that's step one. I've met people who have that problem who are not aware of it themselves. That's uh, then it's worse. But you, but I, I think you, you, for you, for example, taking a, a, a deep breath might work. Several deep breaths. Yeah, like yeah. Every ten seconds. <laughs> because you can sort of notice that you're getting a little out of breath yourself, and you're. You're feeling little, what should I call it, uh, stressed. Yes. You bet that the people who are sitting around you listening to you are also going to feel that way. Yes. And if you then take a deep breath and let it sink in, mm -hmm. they are also going to feel it. So it, it, you don't have to worry that they're going to think that you have nothing to say. Because you know you do, so you know why you're doing it. I mean, I guess some people might have a worry that they should not take a deep breath because then people think they have nothing to say. But I don't think you need. You know, that's not something you have to worry about. Right. <coughs> okay. So and uh, well, with this modern technology, we also have, as you can see, of course, screen projection, and we could have many other things. And uh, the classical environment, large room, arena, podium, could be mass media, re radio, TV. Of course, that changes the situation a bit. Because if we take Marina's question here, if I start to speak with a loud voice on TV or on the radio, I'm not going to be a big success, I <laughs> think. And uh, I sometimes mention the contrast between um, Adolf Hitler and uh, Franklin P. Roosevelt. So both of them spoke, let's say, in the period of 1930 to 1945, okay? Adolf Hitler never realized that the radio had created another situation. He continued always to speak like, you know, he was speaking to a crowd on a big square. Ah! You know, like that. <laughs> and that is what was broadcast. Franklin Roosevelt realized that this was a new situation. He was speaking to millions of people, but he was sitting in his easy chair. And he was speaking like he was speaking to somebody over a coffee table. You know, he, he called it actually his fireside chats. So he was sort of sitting and speaking in a calm voice to the American nation. So that's, that was interesting. I mean, uh, so he probably had better PR consultants or something that told him that, or, he, or else he, ha he probably realized it by his own intuition that this is a very different situation. I cannot just stand there and, and shout. The radio has changed. <coughs> okay. Um, and when you are in this situation of giving a, um, a public speech, this of course is a kind of monologue. It's not interactive so much. I mean, you can see the audience. You can see them so in shame or hooray or whatever. And you can see if they're happy or not. But basically, you have to come to this situation with something prepared that you're going to deliver. So it's, it's less interactive than the debate we just had, right? With, where, where you, most of you even stood up and could sort of one speaker after another, you deliver and you have interchange. That's not the normal case in, in big public speaking. So you can all see that there are different circumstances of 
the way in which rhetoric and argumentation gets to be used, and that needs also maybe well, some special techniques of adjusting what you're doing to the situation. Okay, so if rhetoric is persuasion, the classical idea of argumentation is what we find in uh, Aristotle when he summarized the ideas of antique of Greek of Greece uh, on rhetoric, you might say. So it's actually through his summarization of rhetoric, and we'll come back to that later in, in the course, we also know what we should mean by argumentation. And one might say that argumentation is a kind of special, yeah, special kind of rhetoric. It's the kind of rhetoric where you are trying to seek truth. So in rhetoric in general, any means of persuasion are okay. I mean, you might say to the audience, if you vote for me, I'm all going to, I'm going to see to it that you get an extra bonus in your salary next year. That's an okay, you know, reason to vote for me. But it's not an okay reason if you're doing dialectics, which is what Aristotle called truth-seeking argumentation. Truth-seeking argumentation means that you're trying to find the truth somehow. Like, that's why we have, as you know, the debate we just had, emotion for and against, for and against. And then at the end we're supposed to have a clearer view of what reality is all about, and so we should be able to yeah, understand the world better. So dialectics is this truth-seeking truth uh, argumentation um, where you have pro and contra usually. And the debate we just went through is, is yeah, a, a very classical way of trying to achieve that. Okay, and the, art, the instruments you use for that, you use logic, you use evidence, but as you've seen, of course, also some of the other rhetorical um, means, like uh, pa pathos, ethos, can of course be superimposed on the arguments. I don't know what you were doing when you were listening to the people on the other side, and you were trying to see if their arguments were good or bad. What, I think most of you were probably thinking of, do they have evidence for what they're saying? Does it make sense? Is it logical? I think that's what most people think of, those kind of questions. Perhaps you did, I, I'm not sure that so many people thought that this is too emotional or something like that. I mean, you could think that. And then you would be thinking in a more non-dialectical way, more in a general rhetorical way. Okay, so this kind of uh, argumentation you can find anywhere in principle, but classically, it's in an academic seminar or in a, in a debate of the type we just had. And here, since this is not just monologue in the same way, there's not so much emphasis only on your own point of view that you're trying to persuade people of, but it's also on listening to what the others say and finding counter-arguments to what they are saying. So, you remember the classical rhetor rhetorical term for this? What is it? Refutatio. <laughs> you must start to remember these terms. Actually, these terms are an aid for memory. If you remember those terms, you'll remember some of the things you could do in an argument. <laughs> so, refutatio is where you remember claims that somebody is making, and then you think of the counterclaims to their claims, right? They are, they are trying to argue against you, because so first you think of counterclaims from the other side. Then you think of counterclaims to counterclaims. That's refutatio. So, one, two, three. Yeah. <coughs> then we have this pro question, which I think you've probably heard a lot about before. Uh, so there are several definitions of culture, and this is the one that I believe in. Uh, so here we have culture is patterns between people that are not given by nature. And why, why we have this addition of not given by nature is because if we have a given group of people who all have the ability to breathe, that's not culture, that is nature. 
They all have the ability to walk. That's not culture, that is nature. Culture is always something that does not need to be there by nature. It's culture, in a sense, inhabits the degrees of freedom given by nature. Okay, so we make, we make, we constrain our lives more than we actually have to constrain them by nature. But in doing that, we of course also build up new structures that we are able to use for our own benefit and to make life easier to live. Take language. I mean, in principle, any human being can speak any human language, so we have total freedom. But after we have been trained in one language for 10 years, it's going to get a lot more difficult to speak the other languages. And when we've been trained for 20 years, it's almost getting impossible. You all know, you all have this experience, right? But when we are very small, we can pick up any language, and we can probably pick up several languages also at the same time. This gets harder the more we cultivate nature, the more our speech organs, our brains, and so on, gets attuned to one particular language, one particular type of culture. Okay, so, and we can take culture in a wide sense, where it includes technology, economy, agriculture, etc., or we can take it in a more narrow sense, where it is thinking and behavior. And there is a conflict between people who do this kind of research, where some people have a more mentalistic definition and other people have a broader definition. So one of the big gurus, at least for business people and sometimes for other people too, Kurt Hofstede, Dutchman, whom you probably run into. Yeah. yeah. Does he have a mentalistic definition? Culture as um, universal. Yes. Is that a mentalistic definition? Yes. Yes. He is a very typical representative of a mentalistic definition. So against him, people who don't, like me, would say, Dear Gert, you forgot behavior, artifacts, and traces in nature. Then he's going to say, what? He's going to say that they're derived from his, un his mind. Yeah. And I'm going to say, well, that's what you think. I'm not so sure of that. I think that it's, in fact, the other way around a lot. If we didn't have the books in the libraries, we would forget about what people in our culture used to think was our culture. And culture would change a lot more quickly. But it's because we have the books, the buildings, the roads, etc. When we return to them, then our behavior and thinking gets molded. So in the, in the, this produces a kind of stability of culture. And it explains why cultures don't change so quickly. So here's another place where people actually disagree when they think about culture. How much does culture change? Some people think it changes a lot. Some, pe some people think it doesn't change at all. Strangely enough, Mr. Hofstede not only has a mentalistic definition of culture, but he also thinks it doesn't change. Which is strange. I mean, this is, he explains through his so-called onion model of the mind. Have you heard about this? So you peel off the layers, and inside there's a kernel which is unchanging. Yes, it's an onion model. Onion, now yeah, it's, a, it's a vegetable. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a vegetable. <laughs> yeah? And what do you say, like, in contradiction to a quote about Williams? And say about? Raymond Williams. And I'm not culture, familiar with Raymond Williams. Culture as a whole way of life, which also which specifically includes everyday culture, and he puts more like it's more uh, English uh, cultural studies the focus more on like this daily based behavior, daily communication, daily like how you grow up and what shapes you. And that's often thing the book theater refers to that it's not that high culture and libraries and books and uh, historical buildings that create the culture but more like this everyday life and how we treat each other and how we behave. Mm -hmm. and that's if Raymond Williams oh, he's the media guy, right? Yes. Right, no, no, no. Yeah, if he includes in his definition of culture also the artifacts and the traces in nature, agriculture, 
if he includes that, I'm on, I'm on his side. But I don't know about his modern culture to have a death. Def Our media and a yeah, I now remember who he is. But, uh, okay. but, it, but what you said that he includes a lot about behavior, and that's, I also find that essential. That, even that's problematic in Hofstede's model. You know. So how, what predictions can we make from the fact that we know that a culture is, uh, let's say, individualistic? How are they going, you know, how, what can we say about concrete things about behavior? How, how are they going to treat their guests? Do we know? Well, we can guess. This is one of the problems with the Hofstede approach. It's too abstract. And it's, to my mind, too mentalistic. But that's another talk. We won't do that right now. <laughs> Okay. So another uh, point where people um, have to say something when they theorize about culture is how much variation is there in any kind of group of a reasonable science? Well, there's a lot of variation. So we have many uh, sub-sources, you might say, of, of culture. So here are some, male culture, female culture, child culture, adult culture, social class culture, occupational culture, ideological culture, ethnic culture, national culture, even activity culture. So we do debating in a specific, so we have debating culture, or we have negotiation culture. So all of these sources of variation, how are we going to see them? We look at Hofstede's indices. Are they equally valid for all these activities? Are they the same in all of them? Yeah. I just wonder, when, when you say negotiation culture, yeah. is there really such a thing? Because a negotiation can be between any of these other uh, groups. So uh, a negotiation between a woman and his her, her child will be very different from that of two religious leaders, for example. Yeah, that's a very good uh, question. Um, so if we look at uh, wage, wage negotiations, and we look at yeah. peace negotiations, and we look at negotiations between ch children and parents for way for uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it? Weak money. <laughs> yeah, the money you get. Uh, what's the English term? Pocket, uh, pocket money. Pocket money. Pocket money. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, these are clearly three very different types of negotiations. I agree. So the question. I mean, that's an empirical question. How much do they have in common? I'm not, I don't want to make any claim because I haven't thought about it enough, right? No, but everybody wants to get their own, you know, right? So that's a common feature. Sorry. That's a common feature. But that's fairly abstract. Mm -hmm. that, my point now is that that might need us, you know, to say that not only is there a negotiation culture, maybe there is a culture of parent-child negotiations. Yeah. So it, it would just... Well, if you make that objection to me, my move would be to retreat one step and say maybe we have to be even more specific about the activities we are looking at. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so this is another difficulty that you have with cultural theories. Uh, how much do they allow for variation? What do they say about that? Do they say anything at all? Do they just forget it? Or do they say something about it? And that, of course, is going to create the problem also when we study cross-cultural rhetoric. Whose rhetoric? Okay, so now, here's your second exercise. Thinking about these groups, how can rhetorical style vary within a national ethnic culture? So if you take, for example, Sweden, we have all of these groups. Yet we talk about Swedish culture. That would then be national allegiance, right? That would be national culture. But let's say, okay, so normally we're going to make a lot of statements in this room or in other rooms we have around here about Swedish culture as the course goes on. But we still I want to ask you to think about this, the question of variation before we move into doing that so that you can listen with a critical mind to what things that are going to be said. Okay, so now think about how the rhetorical style can vary within a national ethnic culture. So <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, yeah, there are many sources of, of difference. I, I sort of thought I heard you talking about gender differences. 
Is that what you're talking about? Male style yeah. argumentation and female style? Yeah. Do you yeah. believe there are such differences? Yeah. 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 What are the differences then? Speed up prototyping. Sorry, speed up prototyping. Like men are this. That is, especially from the uh, opposite gender. Women are this. Are like this. I mean, women are more sensitive than men. Men are harder or more rough than female. And, and so when men argue, they argue in a more rough and tough way. Yeah, uh, for example, yeah. Is that true, man? No, no, no. Not for everyone. Not for everyone. Yeah, but, um, I think that. Uh, are prone to, to have more uh, emotional more arguments. emotional yeah, yeah more emotional arguments and to, uh, w while men they prefer logic and facts okay do the rest of the women in here agree I mean, with this stereotyping but uh, still there is difference well, let's listen to what your female companions think do you think this is true women have more emotional arguments and men are more logical is that what you said mm -hmm. yeah what do you think no reaction? What do you think? I'm sure that we have very logical ideas. So you don't agree with And I agree to that extent that I would think that we might add a more holistic perspective to our logical arguments and that we have a certain sense to recognize stuff that is going on around our logical arguments that might influence the discussion. And we might be and I have the tendency to be willing to integrate those whatever, however emotionally constructed elements around our logic elements and we are willing to include this. And men are, are according to you, less holistic? Maybe, maybe less aware of stuff going on. Are we, are we less holistic? Are we less aware? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but there are, which is one difficulty here of EGT was we lack empirical research on many of these points. Actually, we speculate a lot. We have lots of ideas. We have lots of stereotypes. Some of these stereotypes are correct. Some of them are not. But in most cases, we, we will need more research, actually, to say for sure. And that, that, that is in general true about nearly everything when we, when we make these statements about cultural differences that there, we need more research on many of these things. And to say that these ideas rest on stereotypes is not to say that they are wrong. But it's, it's to say that they're not resting on, let's say, well-supported generalizations. They are resting on generalizations that we don't know if they have any good support, really. Well, you might even say they're resting on ill-supported generalizations. Stereotypes are <coughs> generalizations they could be right, but they could also very well be wrong. Okay, so any other examples? So that was the gender one. Any other difference that you got? Yeah. We have the educational one. Yeah. That people with a different educational background might argument or express themselves on a different way or in a different term. And that we can see within a national yeah, so if you have an educated person, you would expect, yeah. yeah, and you have an uneducated person, they would probably have more difficulties with abstract categories and so on. Yeah. Also, my kids or adults, which is age. Yeah. Is this a stereotype or is it a correct generalization? It's correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I think too, but you know, you never know. You have to keep your, your, uh, your skepticism. Okay, good. And so, also about age, maybe. Yeah, age, age okay. Age and maybe cultural, like the change of uh, uh, society values, that you can see a difference because people, maybe in my age, you address different topics than maybe people of an older age are because values have changed or there are taboos that you can nowadays talk about that are very common and useful. No, and someone at a specific age should not address. Yeah. But if, you know, if, you, if you're more radical and you go down to the seven and eight year olds, mm -hmm. if I may uh, report from memory, uh, you would have boys to say, I am right because my brother is much stronger than your brother. <laughs> 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 that's not sure that that's with the... Yeah, but I'm 
Then maybe a woman that is much older than me would not address the topic in the way I do. No, that's true. That's more yeah, no, so each difference is very, we have had different experiences as we grow up and different things have become possible at different times. The language changes. Language language changes. changes. Sure. Yeah. No, I agree. All of these things are important and keep them in mind as we go on. Okay, so we've already talked about this, that we need to understand cultural differences, but we don't necessarily want to add to discrimination and the, or to prejudice, sorry. Uh, prejudice is when we take the stereotypes, the generalizations we make about cultural differences a bit too seriously. Okay. So how should we conceive of cultural differences? Well, there are two main possibilities you might say. There's a lot, I could say a lot more about this, but I want to go over it fairly quickly now. There are two deterministic positions. Deterministic means that if I know that person's culture, I know how that person is. The non-deterministic positions are, if I know that person's culture, I'm, there's some possibility that I know how that person is. Okay, So that's a much weaker position. The, the two deterministic positions are, the first one is the racist position. There you believe that the world is uh, carved up in biological races. And if you go back to the world before 1945, those biological differences were, in many cases, made equivalent to national differences. So there was a German race, there was a French race, there was an Italian race, etc., etc. This, you might say, from our point of view today, was a bit short-sighted. I mean, they didn't know very much about history. If they had thought a little more, more about history, they would have seen that these people have moved around all the time. And there was a lot of mixture everywhere. And so these pure races were partly a fiction. But as you know, a lot of people took them seriously, and that's at the foundation of, well, there are still people today who believe in this stuff, right? The slightly softer but still deterministic position was taken in, or originated in the United States. In opposition to Germany during, before and during the Second World War. And that's cultural determinism. Now you say it's not biological, but it's very deeply fostered into you as you grow up. So very often they had a kind of Freudian theory. So they would talk about the way in which you got milk from your mother's breast and the way in which your father or mother punished you, and et cetera, et cetera. And this led to an extremely deep difference, they would say, between people from different parts of the world. So, and, and in this case also, if you take any person from, let's say, Italy, here we have Stefano, and we <laughs> if we take him, we know immediately with both of these positions that he's going to like spaghetti. Now, it happens to be true in this case, but, don't <laughs> that's, yeah. but, that's, but that's only, what shall I say, a happy coincidence. We might have been wrong. Okay, but, but on the deterministic position, we know a lot of things about people just because they come from a, a certain culture, and we know this with some kind of certainty. But the two other positions, context-sensitive guiding stereotypes, statistical tendencies, it's not like that. If we see Stefano, we can only say, well, a lot of Italians seem to like spaghetti. Uh, he probably likes spaghetti, but we don't know. We really have to ask him. Okay, so all we have then, we have, we have a non-deterministic. We can only say with a certain probability that people who come from Certain cultural areas are going to be like that. They're not necessarily all like that. There are many other factors that could, they could have traveled to other countries. You've already seen the cultural variation. We have differences between men and women, children, different social classes. All of these things mean that actually some of these things that we think are typical of all, I don't know what, French, Slovenians, whatever it is. <laughs> They might be wrong. I've been to Slovenia, you know, I, I, I have my ideas about what Slovenians are like. 
that uh, I, you know, after having talked to him, I'm not sure I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so that, that means that there are softer and harder positions, deterministic and non-deterministic positions, okay? And at least my opinion is that it's not reasonable to have a strong deterministic position. But there are people who have that. There is nations, I think, who huh? has it. There what? is nations who has it. There, there are nations, sure. Nation. Yeah. I believe my opinion, you know, that after Soviet and collapse, all those uh, countries which uh, became independent, they all became like this. They all have these very, very, yeah. very strong yes, deterministic. Yes. Well, I'm not so sure. Why do you say that? <laughs> no, because. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I believe that in this context they, they try to uh, avoid uh, our other like um, nations to become a part of their culture. You know, like yeah. they they consider that uh, uh, their culture is the best. They uh, try to put away people uh, like from uh, those who not belong. It's true that in many of the former Soviet states there are, let's say, ingrained prejudices against some groups. One of the groups that gets hit hit by most prejudices in Europe today, which group is that? Ukraine? Sorry, what was the question oh. again? Gypsies. Yeah. Ah, they are the group in Europe today, I think, which is most hit by prejudice. Yeah. So I'm sure you all have still, not you, you come from Korea, you don't care about gypsies, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but those who come from Europe, they often, they often have prejudice against gypsies. And you'll, tell, you'll ask them, you know, well, I know gypsies are like this. But, if you have a non-deterministic view, you should only say, you know, gypsies, there is a probability. <laughs> but they might not be. I mean, they're like everyone else. They are, there are differences between gypsies. Okay. <coughs> so, note also that if you have this deterministic view, multicultural competence becomes very, very difficult. You cannot really be a member of several cultures. Because you are supposed to be totally, holistically part of one culture only. So how could you then divide yourself? You're going to become schizophrenic. But with the other view, the softer view, it's completely possible. Because then you don't think that culture makes such a total, holistic imprint on your personality. It only covers to some extent. And maybe there's possibility for several cultures to imprint on your personality. Yeah? But how about this point, like, saying that culture has very, very strong impact on you, yeah. but that the culture is exactly the kind of surrounding you up. And then you happen to grow up in a maybe bicultural, or multicultural uh, parenthood. Yeah. Parenthood culture. Yeah. That this is your specific culture, and that this divided cultural... Bicultural. Bicultural, whatever, yeah. Yeah. has this super strong impact. That's true. So that is strong. But, but, but the difference is that that person who drew, grew up in two cultures, let's say his home environment was one culture and his school environment was another, it's very common in Sweden today. No, no. You would say then that that person actually has grown up in two cultures. I would say so anyway. Mm -hmm. But in the, old, in the more de deterministic model, they would say, no, no, they are all schizophrenic. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know which, which leg they're supposed to stand on, etc., etc. But with the more, with the with the less, with the weaker view of cultural differences, you would say that this person could probably benefit from two cultures, could expand their their way of being by by being a member of two cultures and so on and so on. So that, but this is an ongoing discussion. And in the same way, intercultural communication becomes extremely difficult if you have the deterministic view. How can you really understand the person who comes from a th different culture has different ideas about concepts, meanings, etc. If it's totally, if that's, you're totally immersed in this culture, well, you cannot. So therefore you will see statements, sometimes by people who believe in the deterministic, I could never really understand the Japanese, or I could never really understand Latin Americans. They are basically different from us, you know, that kind of statement. But again, if you have a weaker definition, it's more a question of more or less. You can understand other people to some extent. You can maybe even understand them totally if you try long enough. If you, you know, it's a question of how much you try, how much you 
understand about the other culture, etc., etc. So it's a question of degree. Good? Yes, yes. Yep. And maybe also language knowledge, you know, as well. If you don't know language uh, of another cu culture, you probably cannot understand so like, good another culture. No, that's right. That's a, so a, a very strong part of multiculturalism is multilingualism. Uh, you're, you're not, I, I never really believe somebody who claims to be multicultural if they don't know the language of the different cultures they're supposed to be a member of. Uh, they really have, you're nodding all the time, are you multicultural? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you nodding so much? Makes sense. You believe it anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am. I grew up with three languages and three cultures. Norwegian, Swedish and English. And then, you know, it's, I don't see that, it's not a, some people tried to tell me when I was growing up that this is a problem. Sometimes they made it the problem for me, but basically I didn't believe them. <laughs> I thought it was great, I could go to Norway, speak Norwegian, I could go to England or America and get up, yeah, no problem. Of course, it, I had to learn a lot, I had to learn about the way things are done in these countries. I had, so that when they speak quickly and they, they presuppose a lot of things that, that, that they don't explain, then I have to, you know, I have to know what they were talking about. Otherwise I wouldn't pass. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I couldn't live comfortably. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being multicultural or multilingual is not a lazy person's dream. If you want to be active multi active multicultural person, active multi that takes a lot of work. Yeah. But uh, do you think that uh, people who uh, grew up in uh, like mixed uh, families in other cultures, they actually have at some point of their life this identity crisis? Because we know many people who can't answer uh, where they come from because they have so many. Yeah, that uh, uh, people around. If I take myself, people use. But which team do you actually? Uh, support when Sweden plays Norway in soccer. You know what the answer I cultivated over the years? I don't really care about football. <laughs> <sighs> That's the answer I cultivated, okay? So that meant that I could say, I don't care. It's not one of my problems, it's maybe your problem. <laughs> So Some people actually, it is. I found I found ways, you know, out when people try to put me on such questions, I found other ways to to deal with. It. You don't look you don't look convinced. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I wasn't thinking about you. I was thinking in general. In general, yeah. But don't you think there is a big uh, like some, some people might have a problem? I agree. So if you're very much fond of football and you feel you have to be you know, on one side or another. And for example, Carlos down here, were you fond of football? You're a bi bicultural person, right? Yeah, I try cultural. Try, yeah. so did you have a problem with the football problem with it? No, I think it's a pointless <laughs> sport. <laughs> same as me. Yeah. 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 We found the same solution, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, but there are many solutions. Some people, I agree, will have some problems. In, in taking allegiance with one or another side. Especially if a war breaks out. Then they might have more serious problems. If they really have, and maybe they're even forced to be soldiers for one side. That happens sometimes. And then, of course, you get more problems. Because then <coughs> the national culture is forced on you. And you have to take, but it's forced by the outside. It's not really forced from the inside by yourself, I think. In many cases. It seems more problematic for people around those multinational yeah. people, That's not right. for the own people. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's more a problem for the surrounding than it is for the people themselves. But they make it the problem sometimes for the people themselves. Yeah. <coughs> okay, another debate that comes up that we will also have reason to consider in this course, how great are the cultural differences? So, there are basically three positions here. There is the position that uh, there are no interesting differences between cultures. It's all overstated. Hype talk. There is a position that the differences are very great. And there is an intermediate position. Okay. The position that, that there are no really interesting differences between cultures is called universalism. 
So we believe in universal human nature and that it is very strong and we really don't have to worry about culture. Okay, then you believe that cultural differences are very insignificant, people are basically alike, <coughs> characterized by rationality, agenthood and ethics, claims about cultural differences mostly a way of hiding something else. You know, you say that the Chinese do this because they're Chinese, but really you should have said the Chinese do this because they are selfish, or they are stupid, or <laughs> something like that, okay? So you have a kind of universalistic theory instead of a cultural theory, okay? So you, you believe that such qualities as being stingy, or being brave, or being aggressive, that these are universal qualities and they're not really cult. That's what the universalist position would be. Okay, the opposite position is cultural determinism now. Here you say that cultural differences are very important, people are basically different, and rational, rationality, agenthood, and ethics are culture dependent. So when we come to rhetoric, you see that this is going to make a big difference. If you are a universalist, then you're going to say, here is logic. It's the same for all human beings. You should all learn logic. If you learn logic, you'll be happy. <laughs> That's my position. No, I wrote the textbook on logic once. <laughs> okay. If you take the other position, the, uh, the cultural deterministic position, then you're going to say, no, there's nothing like universal rationality. It's all different. German rationality is different from French rationality. It's different from English rationality. This is the uh, pre-war uh, position, actually. The Nazis probably would have argued this way. <coughs> okay, so there's nothing like that. And then, then of course, if you come to rhetoric, you're going to find, in rhetoric, the people who believe this are going to find it difficult to go along with dialectics, truth-seeking argumentation, because they're going to say, there's nothing like, you know, universal norms that carry you toward the truth. It's all different depending on who you are, etc. Context, culture, etc. Okay, so we have that, this, this theme, how big are the differences and how important are that's going to come through here. And you will have to make up your own mind when you read about the different cultural traditions, if they are like you or if they are different. Okay, and then the compromise position is where we say that there are differences and they have a certain role, they have a certain influence. Uh, so people are both similar and different because of human nature and cultural background, but we need to find out much more about in which respects this is so. What is cultural, what is natural. And I think if you look at the world today, there are a number of scientists who are trying to become much more specific about the influence of culture than was the case earlier. This is especially true in linguistics. How many of you know anything about linguistics? Not much. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. In linguistics, to give you a short story, we can say that most linguists were cultural determinists in some sense. They believed until about 1950 that language had a very strong role for thinking. Then Noam Chomsky came along, and he argued the opposite. He was on the universalist side. He said that all human languages have a kind of common structure. And a lot of linguists became universalists. They would say, you know, we, the, these differences are not deep structure, as the term was, okay? We have to look for the deep structures which are universal, given by human biology, common for all human beings. But time went on, and about 20 years ago, people started to say, maybe that was going a bit too far in the universalist direction. And now people are discovering again that language actually is pretty important for the way we think. But now it's, uh, let's say, not a, a talk, it's not the statement that it's important for everything. It's more like an attempt to show for exactly which things is language important. And people are showing it for sub areas. So for example, for uh, expressions of localization, here, there, you might think that all languages have words like here and there. And then you might think that's that, how can you have a language if you don't have something like here, there, etc. But it turns out that there are languages where you don't have this. 
is that they have a north-south orientation in the language. Yeah. And if you go on, there are, there are some surprises. There are languages where there are no numerals. Not very many, but two languages have been discovered without numerals. There are languages where there are no color words. No concept of time. Yeah. So, you know, that's fairly radical. So, let's say the whole idea about how much language means for our culture, for our way of thinking, etc., that's been being reevaluated. But I think it's being reevaluated with more skepticism today than it was when it was proposed, let's say, 50 or 60 years ago. Now, now it's coming back, but it's coming back more slowly in different areas. So in, in there, that, that's a very nice illustration of these, of these differences. Okay, so now I wanted you to think about two examples of possible culturals, cultural differences in rhetorical style. So instead of giving you time, maybe some of you can think of something right off the bat, since we're coming close to, the, uh, to 5 o'clock. What's the difference? Yeah? Uh, for example, in Germany, where we have uh, a strong hierarchy in society, the way how you address the audience, and when you have your own universal rhetoric, and how you greet people, and how you have to stick to certain hierarchies, and who you have to address first, and the titles you have to mention, is a total cultural difference in rhetoric compared to maybe a speech in Sweden. Okay. You know that we also have to learn to live with counter examples. Counter examples? Yes. When we have scientific debates. I'm not going to give you a counter example. No, you agree? I don't agree. So <laughs> we we have been analyzing German political debates on TV. Okay. We find that the Germans are much more willing to argue and shout and interrupt each other than the Swedes. Yeah, but you still keep like, what? Mr. Dr. Müller, yes, I yes. stimme nicht mit Ihnen ein, ich schreibe Sie jetzt an, wenn Sie nie mehr auf Verzicht Ihren Doktor zu nennen. Precisely, precisely. I shall let you, but I will never that's right, that's talk right. over your doctor. So, so it's a much more direct and aggressive style, but using formal titles. Yes. So it's very different from the Swedish style, where they would try you know, to not use any formal titles and be much more inhibited in their aggression. So I'm only partly disagreeing with this. <laughs> okay. But exactly. But it's so, you know, and, and actually TV, as you will get some assignments here, and uh, YouTube and so on, will provide you with examples of political debating. And you'll see that there are actually fairly e easily noticeable differences <laughs> between different cultures in this respect. Yeah? Uh, I have an example from Turkey where uh, the, the biggest dis dis distinction, rhetorical distinction, is between urban people and the people from countries. Yeah. Because urban people will use the rhetorics of a uh, common Westerner while the countryside people will play to uh, emotions 24-7. Right. It's all about emotions. In the countryside? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that's about... We're going to spend a lot of time looking at traditional ways of arguing, and we'll see that actually comes back in, in much of traditional rhetoric. And that this development towards more dialectics and, and logic is maybe a later development. Yeah? I was thinking about a um, little broader differences, not maybe in style, but the use of um, uh, certain tricks or, or maybe style, like for instance uh, metaphors. Yeah. That, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm stereotyping here also, but uh, Asian rhetorics, or, or maybe like Buddhist speech, uh, especially Buddhist, use more. Uh, for persuasion, more metaphors that are culturally uh, linked. So maybe I, as a Westerner, cannot always understand if they, you know, give me a metaphor about the grasshopper and, and the rabbit yeah. or something like that. And but in Asia, we understand that because it's a uh, culture. Well, you know, in general, religion, of course, is about intangible, intangible things, abstract things. 
and you have to make it somehow graspable to the people you're talking to. And if these people are simple peasants who live in a world of the rabbits and grasshoppers, <laughs> uh, if you're a skilled uh, orator, that you will use. You will use the experience of these people to try to explain what you're doing. And metaphor, as we will see, is something that does not automatically occur in the first uh, rhetoric we see around the world. Metaphor in itself is actually based on similarity abstraction. And we'll come to that. And that actually requires a little more sophisticated cognition. So as rhetoric develops, that, that's one of the things that come up. And most probably you have these Buddhist preachers that are pretty uh, sophisticated cognitively. <laughs> so they, they come up with good metaphors. Also, the Bible actually is full of... Yeah, all religious leaders do. Huh? All religious leaders do, actually. Yeah, yeah. They use metaphors. Right. They have to. I think because they're speaking of, of things Something which are not so easily graspable. Yeah. yeah, that I think is my introduction to this topic. So I hope you uh, will ha enjoy this course and we'll meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.